thanks for the invitation uh, and the introduction. Uh, so the title is quite a mouthful, uh, and uh, the it the talk that I will uh, give will be about joint work. And let me tell you who my co-authors are. So it's uh, joint uh, with uh, Jonas Bergström uh, and Adrian Diaconi and Craig Westerland. Uh, and there is a second paper, which is also joint with Jeremy Miller and Peter Pabst and Oscar Randall Williams. And both papers are on the archive. Um, and I will try to make some sort of distinction of which results I'll talk about are from first and which are from the second paper. Um, so the subject of these two papers is uh, moments of the family of quadratic L functions over a function field. Um, so let me describe the problem. So we'll fix Q, uh, sorry, an odd prime power. And we consider the following sum. We sum over polynomials uh, of degree 2g plus 1. And we want these to be monic. I want them to be square free. And for each such uh, polynomial, one can consider a hyperliptic curve with equation y squared equals d of x. And the condition that it's square free says that this is a smooth algebraic curve over this finite field. And as such, it has an attached L function. So let me call this curve CD. And uh, what you can do is you can look at the zeta function of this uh, variety. And you look at the numerator of the zeta function, and that's some polynomial evaluated at q to the minus s. And this is of degree 2g. And the roots of this polynomial are exactly the eigenvalues of Frobenius on the first cohomology group of this curve, et al. cohomology group. And uh, this numerator of the zeta function uh, defines the L function. Uh, so we um, is this visible? Okay. It, we define this to be L of S uh, chi D. And what we're going to be summing is uh, the central value of this L function. So there's a functional equation that relates the value at s and at 1 minus s and 1 half is the central value and we raise this quantity to the rth power. And finally, I want to normalize uh, by dividing by the number of terms in this sum. Actually, it's going to be more convenient to just normalize this by q to the minus 2g minus 1, which is um, not quite the number of square free monic polynomials, but they differ by a an easily understood factor. So we want to understand this quantity uh, as uh, the degree of the polynomial goes to infinity, meaning the genus of the curve. Uh, let me scroll down a bit. And the conjecture is let me give this quantity a name. Uh, I'm going to call this MR of G. And the conjecture uh, that comes from Conry Farm, Keith, Conry Farmer, Keating, Rubenstein, Snaith, is that this quantity, as G goes to infinity, 
is given by an explicit polynomial uh, plus an error term that goes to zero. Um, where you are is an explicit polynomial. Degree R times R plus one, two. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the formula for this uh, explicit polynomial. It's not very enlightening when you see it. Um, and it's, it's a massive formula. Uh, but the content of the conjecture is not a specific formula, but it's rather the recipe that they give for how to predict what are the moments of various families of L functions? So this is an, an instance of a family of L functions that we're interested in. And uh, we are looking here at the rth moment of the central value of this L function. Um, so this is just one special case of a very general uh, method for giving predictions for what are these moments. And it's very refined information because it's not just a dominant term, but all of the lower order terms. And um, before I go any further, I should make some comments about this conjecture. Um, the first comment is that you can uh, derive the same conjecture by a different means. And this was done by uh, Diakonir, Goldfeld, and Hofstein using multiple Dirichlet series. So they uh, gave a, a different way of obtaining conjectural asymptotics using conjectured analytic properties with these multiple Dirichlet series. Uh, and it gives the same conjecture. Um, uh, and I should say that in the original paper of Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, Snaith, they do look at the quadratic family, but not the quadratic family over function fields, but over number fields, which would be quadratic Dirichlet L functions instead of these L functions attached to hyperelliptic curves. I didn't say the word hyperelliptic curve, but hyperelliptic curve means a curve that can be written in this form. Y squared is D of X. Uh, and the, the, the general recipe from Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, Snaith was, was uh, carried out in a different paper of Andrade and Keating. So they worked out what should be the prediction in the function field case. And this philosophy of moments uh, goes back to study of the Riemann zeta functions. So in the case of the Riemann zeta, uh, you could be interested in well, there's only one uh, Riemann zeta function, so it doesn't really make sense to, to fit it in a family. But what does make sense is you can study the uh, distribution of the value along the critical line as opposed to the value at one half. So in a sense, that's a continuous family of L functions. And if you're interested in the value distribution of zeta along the critical line, you can study the moments like this. Uh, and a conjecture, which is wide open, is that this should be asymptotically equal to CRT log R squared T. Uh, where CR is an explicit constant, which was conjectured by Keating and Snaith using random matrix theory. And this recipe of Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, Snaith can be used to give a more precise version of this conjecture, which doesn't just give the dominant term, but all lower order terms as well. Uh, when this is given as a polynomial in uh, uh, the logarithm. Uh, and this conjecture is known for r equals uh, 1 and 2. 
uh, goes back to Ingham and Hardy and Littlewood, uh, but beyond that, it's not known. Um, but uh, their original motivation was the study of the Lindelöf hypothesis. Because the Lindelöf hypothesis can be uh, formulated equivalently in terms of these moments of Riemann zeta function, and that this should be bounded by t to the one plus epsilon for all big epsilon bigger than zero. Um, now, for the quadratic case, uh, maybe I should label this conjecture star, star is known for r up to three and partially for r equals four. By partially, I mean that uh, one knows the first few coefficients of the polynomial, but not the whole polynomial. And this is largely due to the work of Alexandra Florian. Um, in the number field case, the analogous question for the quadratic family is also known for r up to three. Uh, and the r equals three case is due to Sounder Arajan. Um, and you might think that the number field case should be harder than the function field case, because in the function field case, we know the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, and we know a lot more than the Riemann hypothesis. We know the Riemann hypothesis for, uh, well, we know the grand Riemann hypothesis, so to speak. Um, but previously, uh, it, it had seemed that the number field and the function field case were uh, on the same order of difficulty because uh, we, we, are, we are not much further uh, in the function field case. Uh, but in fact, uh, the, it turns out that you can go further in the function field case. And the theorem that comes out of the two papers, uh, one with Bergström, Diakoni, and Westerland, and the other with Miller, Batst, and Randall Williams, is that this quantity MR of G you can write this as uh, this explicit polynomial QR of 2G plus 1 plus an error term that looks like big O of 4 to the power G times R plus 1, Q to the power minus uh, G plus six divided by 12. And the point is that if Q is sufficiently large, this is indeed an error term. So four to the G times R plus one, it grows very fast with G, but uh, the other term Q to the minus G plus six over 12 goes to zero exponentially fast. And if Q is sufficiently large with respect to R, then this is indeed an error term. So for every fixed R, once we choose Q sufficiently big, this conjecture star is indeed proved. So that's a statement of a theorem. Um, are there questions at this point? Okay, I'm going to uh, say something about how we prove this. Uh, and as I hinted in the title of the talk, uh, this is proven using homotopy theory. Uh, I just realized I don't have a clock. Oh, here we go. Am I sharing this? So here we go. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, the method is to use homotopy theory and the link between topology and arithmetic is via the grothendieck lefschetz trace formula. So I indicated at the start of the talk that you know, we, we know a lot more than, uh, uh, than just uh, the Riemann hypothesis. We know the grand Riemann hypothesis. And in a sense, we know even more than that because we have a full formalism of etal cohomology and etal sheaves and uh, six functors formalism and whatnot. And this grothendieck lefschetz trace formula is part of this thing that we know that goes far beyond the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, let me state the grothendieck lefschetz trace formula. If you have a smooth scheme over FQ uh, of finite type, and V is an L adic local system on X, and there's a formula that looks like this. You sum over the FQ points of X. You take the trace of the Frobenius on the stock of the local system at X. And this is the same as Q to the dimension of X times the trace Oh, let me keep writing here. Of Frobenius on the homology of X with coefficients in B. And this is a tall homology. Um, and I should make some comments on this formula. Um, if you know the Vey conjectures, uh, that concerns the case when V is the trivial local system. And when V is the trivial local system, then on the left-hand side, you're just taking the trace of the identity on a one-dimensional vector space, and that's a one. So you're just counting the number of points of X over FQ. And the right-hand side is what gives a cohomological interpretation to the number of points on the variety. But in this form, you can also allow for a weighted count of the number of points. And I assumed that X is smooth here in order to write it in this particular form, which will be the, the way it's used in the argument. If it's not smooth, you would have to write it in terms of compact support cohomology. But for smooth schemes, compact support cohomology is isomorphic to homology with a Tate twist. And that Tate twist explains why you take Q to the dimension of X, because that's the amount that you need to Tate twist. And the trace on the right-hand side is taken in a graded sense. So the homology is a graded vector space. And what it really means is the sum of the traces and all of the even degrees minus the traces and all of the odd degrees. So it's the usual super trace. Um, and so far it doesn't really link arithmetic to topology because both sides here are very much arithmetic objects. But the further result is the art in comparison theorem. which says that a tall homology of X with coefficients in V can be identified with a singular cohomology with a set of complex points of X and the analytification of this local system. Um, well, and there's a canonical such identification. Uh, here, for the art in comparison theorem to be true, I need X to be a 
subfield of the complex numbers. Uh, so certainly not a finite, uh, something that's defined over a finite field. Um, so um, to uh, make sense of what I'm about to say, you can assume that x is defined over the integers. And then if you have x defined over the integers, you can both embed it into the complex numbers. You can also reduce it modulo prime to get something defined over a finite field or prime power. Um, and then you are forced to ask whether the tall cohomology of your reduction mod p coincides with the tall cohomology of the thing that you get by embedding into the complex numbers. That's not always true. It's true for uh, generic uh, specialization at some prime. Uh, in our setting, it's going to be true at every prime. And that's because uh, the schemes we're looking at have uh, normal crossing divisors that are smooth, uh, normal crossing divisor compactifications that are smooth over the integers. But um, this is all technicalities. Uh, the point is that for all the schemes that we care about, the et al homology, which is the thing that controls the number of FQ points and the, these weighted counts, the number of points, can be identified with the homology of a corresponding complex algebraic variety that can then be studied by uh, topological methods. And in our case, we're going to take X to be the configuration space of N distinct ordered points on the affine line. Uh, so this is a smooth scheme over the integers. And it makes sense to reduce it modulo prime and it makes sense to embed it into the complex numbers. And if I form this embedding into the complex numbers, uh, I get the usual space of N distinct unordered points in the plane, which is a K pi one. And it's K pi one for the braid group on N strands. Beta N is the art in braid group. Uh, and this is good because if we go back to the original conjecture, which is up here, uh, we were summing over monic square free polynomials of a given degree. And that's exactly the same as summing over FQ points of this configuration space of distinct unordered points because a monic square free polynomial can be uniquely identified with a configuration of distinct unordered points, namely its roots. Uh, and in the Grothendieck Grothendieck-Lefret's trace formula, we were summing over the FQ points. So it's going to turn out that the uh, right-hand side of the grothendieck left trace formula becomes the right-hand side of the Connery-Farmer-Keating-Rubenstein-Snaith conjecture, and the left-hand sides are also identified. And the particular local system we care about is going to be of the form exterior algebra on some other local system, W, where W is the reduced Rao representation of the braid group specialized at t is minus one. So I take this representation of the braid group called the reduced Borau representation. I, uh, that depends on a parameter. If I specialize it at the root of unity, the monodromy of this representation is related to the family of curves, y to the p equals uh, d of x. 
Um, so if I take a primitive pth root of unity, I would get something related to that particular family of curves. And when I take t is minus one, I get exactly the monodromy of the universal family of hyperelliptic curves. And I should take a half integer t twist of w to be correct. Uh, and the description I just gave of W is only valid over the complex numbers, but it turns out that there's a natural way to define it in an alladic setting, and uh, it's what you should do. And uh, the upshot is that we need to estimate the trace of the Frobenius on the homology of the braid group, the coefficients in this thing. Oh, and I, I, I guess I, yeah, I guess I should write this differently. Yeah, what you're taking the trace of depends on R. R is the moment, and uh, it depends on R in this way. Um, and why is that? Well, the left-hand side of Groth and Miklefschet's trace formula gives the left-hand side of the CFKRS conjecture. Uh, the right-hand side of Groth and Lefschetz is exactly this trace of Frobenius up to this factor q to the dimension of x. The dimension of x is n, and q to the n is exactly this normalizing factor that I divided by in formulating the theorem or the conjecture. And we need to estimate this as n goes to infinity. And if you are, uh, if you come to this talk from a topology background, which uh, maybe not a lot of people are doing, this immediately suggests that what you should be doing here is something about homological stability. Uh, and homological stability is this paradigm that's been important in, in uh, topology for uh, since the 70s. And uh, and applies to many families of discrete groups that are interesting to topologists. Uh, let me say a few words about homological stability. So you can think about topological groups or more other general families of space, but let me formulate things for discrete groups. So suppose I have a sequence of groups like so. And you can think of the braid groups or the symmetric groups or general linear groups over some ring. These are all very good examples to keep in mind. And you can ask if these satisfy homological stability, and this would mean that these homomorphisms or isomorphisms for k less than, say, some constant times n, uh, then we say that this sequence has homological stability. And what's interesting is that this happens for many well-studied and natural families of discrete groups, uh, such as uh, symmetric groups, braid groups, general linear groups over some rings, uh, mapping class groups. And moreover, computing the homology of the groups individually in the sequence rapidly becomes intractable and, and also maybe the answer is not so structural. Whereas the stable homology, which is the limiting value that you get when you send n to infinity, 
uh, is more computable and in many cases more interesting reveals new structures. And uh, I formulated this here just as homology of the groups themselves, which I guess implicitly means constant coefficients, but it's also interesting to study homological stability with twisted coefficients. This has also been done in these uh, classical families of groups, like the symmetric groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and here we're looking at the homology of the braid groups, and we're taking the limit of the homology in some sense as n goes to infinity, and we're taking a, a very nice family of coefficient systems for which uh, it was in fact known that homological stability would hold uh, already before our work. And it seems that what we should be looking at is, is what is the stable homology of the braid groups with these particular coefficients. So already before us, it was known that um, braid groups have homological stability for any polynomial coefficient system. I'm not going to tell you precisely what a polynomial coefficient system is. Um, and all of these exterior powers of this Bura representation is polynomial. So this exterior power wedge K of W is polynomial of degree K. Uh, and W itself is linear polynomial of degree one. Uh, which is good. Uh, however, the stable range is of the form uh, This map is an isomorphism for k less than n over 2 minus the degree of this coefficient system. Uh, and this is uh, come from a paper of Oscar Randall Williams. And Natalie Wall. Um, and they give a very general homological stability theorem that applies to many different families of discrete groups. Uh, and it always gives for all these families of groups, uh, a stability theorem for polynomial coefficient systems. Uh, and it always has this shape where it depends on the degree of polynomiality. And now there is a problem that arises, which is that here we were looking at the full exterior algebra on W, which is the direct sum of all exterior powers. Uh, and these include summons of arbitrarily high degree. But that's bad in this theorem because then the degree is unbounded and the effective range of homological stability is zero when you're taking homology with coefficients in the full exterior algebra, which is the thing that we want to understand. Um, so uh, 
something different must be done somehow. So in our case, uh, where V is the full exterior algebra on W, the degree is unbounded. And moreover, uh, even if we did know homological stability for these coefficients, meaning the full exterior algebra on W, uh, that would give us the wrong answer. Because if we had stability for uh, this full exterior algebra, tensor with itself R times, then we would end up proving that this quantity mr of g converges as g goes to infinity to the trace of Frobenius on the stable homology with these particular coefficients. But this is not what we wanted to prove. We wanted to prove that this asymptotically grows like a polynomial. We don't want to show that it converges to some number. Um, so we don't, Randall Williams Wall's result does not prove stability, and we also don't expect stability to be true because it contradicts the CFKRS conjecture. Uh, so something different must be done. And uh, what is better to do is to decompose is full exterior algebra into irreducible representations for the symplectic group. And uh, where did the symplectic group come from? Uh, well, this Bura representation is actually a homomorphism from beta 2g plus 1 to sp2gz. So this representation w goes from the braid group to the symplectic group. And then if I decompose the exterior algebra on the fundamental representation of the symplectic group into irreducibles and the tensor algebra, uh, you can tensor with itself four times and still decompose into irreducibles. And uh, you can ask about what are the multiplicities of individual algebraic representations of the symplectic group inside this uh, tensor product? And now the striking fact is that the multiplicity of a given irreducible representation v lambda in this tensor product is given by a polynomial in G uh, of degree R times R plus one over two which is exactly uh, the degree of this polynomial in the CFKRS conjecture, which is not a, a coincidence. Uh, and I should say something about how to interpret this fact that I just stated. So if I fix a partition lambda, uh, I can think of that as indexing not just a single representation of some symplectic group, but actually a consistent sequence of representations of all symplectic groups simultaneously. So um, irreducible representations of this symplectic group, I will index by partitions, lambda one, bigger than lambda two and so on, bigger than lambda g, bigger than zero. Now, if I have a partition of some finite length, by padding it with zeros, 
I can make it into a sequence of partitions of all possible lengths. And that gives me a, a consistent sequence of irreducible representations of all symplectic groups simultaneously. And once I've fixed lambda, any partition, I can ask about its multiplicity when I decompose this guy into irreducibles. And I let the genus G go to infinity. Uh, and this quantity is the thing that's given by the degree uh, R times R plus one over two polynomial. And the polynomial depends on that. Uh, and you see this using how duality. Uh, but this is the key point. Um, but that's great. I should also say, by the way, that uh, if I if I have g small, then uh, v lambda doesn't really correspond to representation because here I said that irreducible representation of the symplectic group corresponded to partitions of this length. And if lambda is uh, is of length bigger than g, then v lambda is, should not be uh, thought of as an irreducible representation. So v lambda is just formally set to be 0. And then the formulas that I write down later are going to make sense. But this fact that this is given by a polynomial of degree r times r plus 1 over 2 it should only be taken to be true when g is large enough that v lambda is non-zero. Anyway, um, that's all technicalities. So, one thing instead to prove homological stability or braid groups with these irreducible v lambda coefficients. And now I think I'm in a position to state the main theorems of the two papers. So the theorem proven with Jeremy Easter. I didn't write it down. Well, the theorem with Jeremy, uh, Peter, uh, and Oscar is that this stabilization map. is actually an isomorphism for k less than approximately n over 12. And I say less than approximately meaning that up to, uh, up to a constant. So k less than n over 12 minus 2 or something. I don't remember. Um, and the point here is that this is independent of lambda. So I told you that uh, there's this theorem of Randall Williams and Wall that gives homological stability for families of discrete groups with polynomial coefficient systems. And the stability range always depends on the degree of polynomiality and it's sharp. For a general polynomial coefficient system, you cannot get any bound that is independent of the degree. And the point here is that if you specialize to this very specific situation where you have a family of irreducible representations of an arithmetic se sequence of arithmetic groups, and your coefficients are taken from this sequence of arithmetic groups, then you can prove a stable range for this homological stability that has no dependence on the specific representation you choose. And this is the 
key ingredient that allows us to control the error term in the main theorem. And the second theorem that I want to say, which is from this Bergström Diakoni Western paper, is the explicit calculation of what is the stable homology with these particular coefficients. And uh, I'm going to write down the formula, but it's it's not super enlightening, uh, as I'm sorry to say. But it's given by a generating series. So I sum over all partitions lambda, all homological degrees k. I take the dimension of the kth homology of the stable braid group on infinitely many strands with these v lambda coefficients. And then I take a sure polynomial in infinitely many variables. I take the transpose of this partition lambda. So I uh, flip the Ferrer's diagram around. And I multiply this with a formal parameter minus z to the k. So I keep track of the partition by using these sure polynomials in infinitely many variables. And I keep track of the homological degree using this parameter z. And this expression now lives in, I take the ring of symmetric polynomials in infinitely many variables. I adjoin an indeterminate z. And then I have to take a completion because this is an infinite sum. And the claim is that this formula is equal to Something that I will write as follows. X of Z inverse log of one plus Z that's sum of K bigger than zero, Z to the K, H two K minus one minus E two. Uh, and this exp and log are certain operations called the plethistic exponential and the plethistic logarithm. It's not the usual exponential and the usual logarithm, which were introduced by Getzler and Kapranov in their work on modular operands. And these are universal operations that act on complete lambda rings and this completed polynomial algebra over the ring of symmetric functions. That's an example of a complete lambda ring. Um, so the, the takeaway is that there's this formula that looks a bit mysterious, but it's actually quite computable. You can give this formula to a computer and it will tell you exactly what are the stable homologies with coefficients in various V lambdas. Uh, and it will do so quite fast. So any uh, anything like Sage that can do calculations with symmetric functions will do this for you. And you can say structural things about what the stable homology looks like. Uh, and moreover, the homology, the braid group, with these coefficients, is pure Tate of weight. Uh, I should write K here minus k plus the size of lambda minus 2k plus lambda. Meaning that the Frobenius eigenvalues are uh, q to the minus 2k plus size of lambda. So I know exactly what all of the eigenvalues of Frobenius are uh, on the stable homology. And this is precisely what I need to estimate Here, I wanted to estimate the. Uh... Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I wanted to estimate this as n goes to infinity, and now I know both the dimensions of the stable groups and I know the Frobenius eigenvalues on the stable groups. And 
uh, one can give an infinite product expansion. of this uh, exp log formula. Uh, and this is, uh, you prove a general identity for the platistic exponential logarithm that gives you an infinite product, which matches uh, the Euler product. From the CFKRS conjecture. So the Euler product that comes out of the recipe turns out to match exactly this exp log formula that's proved by topological methods. Um, and once you have these two theorems, it's not uh, so much more work that has to be done to uh, prove this uh, theorem that I stated earlier. So it's really these two give you, uh, give you the result. Uh, the first controls the error term, and the second tells you exactly what the polynomial is that it converges to. And uh, my time is nearing the end. So let me just say something about what goes into the proofs of the two. Um, so for the paper with Jeremy, Oscar, and Peter, we use this thing called cellular EK algebras. Um, and this is a recent invention of uh, Sander Coopers, Søren Galatius, and Oscar Randall Williams, and it's a it's a modern and multiplicative approach to proving homological stability theorems. I, I don't know if it would be possible to prove our result using this, uh, sorry, prove it without these cellular EK algebras, but uh, I do believe that they are essential. Um, and the key idea is that we want to prove this uniform stability for these particular coefficients that come from arithmetic groups and what we do is we lift uh, uniform stability from the symplectic groups to the braid groups. And the point is that we do know this uniformity for this stable range for the symplectic groups. Uh, from Borel's work. So Borel in the 70s proved uh, exactly what is the stable homology of sequences of classical arithmetic groups. And in his work, he proves this for coefficients in any irreducible representation, and he gives a stable range that's independent of the specific representation, which is exactly what we need for the braid groups. And the goal then is to lift this uniformity from the symplectic groups to the braid groups. And this can be done by writing down an appropriate EK algebra that measures the difference between these two groups, in a sense. And something about what goes on in the other paper is that we are inspired by uh, what was proven by Madsen and Weiss, uh, proof of the Mumford conjecture. The Madsen and Weiss proved the Mumford conjecture, which calculates the stable homology of the mapping class groups, as opposed to the braid groups. And there are now several different proofs of the Madsen and Weiss. One is via scanning, and the scanning proof which is due to Galatius and uh, Randall Williams, is the one that we try to adapt to our setting. And 
Madsen and Weiss were interested in constant coefficients, but one can adapt what they did to polynomial coefficients and non-trivial coefficients. And uh, this was explained in a paper of Randall Williams, and we try to adapt it to, to this hyperelliptic family. And it turns out that many of the same ideas work, and in a sense, they are simpler, and some other things are more complicated. Um, and from this, you can eventually derive this generating series. Uh, and if you do things using logarithmic geometry, you can make the constructions Galois equivariant enough to compute the Galois action on the stable homology as well. Uh, this was uh, a very sh short proof sketch, uh, or it, it was not a proof sketch. It was a, a list of ingredients. Uh, uh, but I'd be happy to say more about it. Uh, I think I will stop here. Thanks for listening.